Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Glorio Chat, the best anime podcast on the internet. So they say. Yep. So we say. I don't know if anybody else says, but so uh, they asterisk say. Yes. Uh, yeah. So you know, I wanted to kick things off with a, a little motivational message for our listeners out there. You know, if you're, you know, if you're struggling with something, maybe having a little bit of a hard time with something, and uh, you know, you're losing hope, thinking about giving up. Just always remember. They announced a new Soccer Wars game in 2019. <laughs> Hell yeah. You. you know, I think technically Truly. it was announced last year, but this year is like the first trailer or anything. And Truly also announcing that. Possible. Yeah. The, I mean, but, hey, man, uh, it's not just the long- new Soccer Wars, right? It's that they announced it with like, and also coming to the West. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, hey, as soon as they busted out that uh, that old theme song, I was like, all right. All right, we, we we in it again, I guess. <laughs> so also, here's, here's, the, the Bubuki Baranki writer is working on that. Yeah, so. with uh, character designs yeah. by uh, famed uh, famed artist slash clothing designer slash certainly not a writer, uh, <laughs> Tite Kubo. Yes, uh, of Bleach fame, yes. Yeah. But uh, it, I, I think my favorite joke going around with all this, aside from the fact that the odds of us ever seeing another Soccer Wars game was so slim, uh, was the uh, <laughs> Soccer Wars fans can't wait to play the game for the first time. Uh, <laughs> I feel like a lot of people have been interested in Soccer Wars, but very few people have actually played it due to the hoops that you have to jump that we would have yeah. had to jump through. Like the only one um, that ever really got brought over here was the one on the Wii, which. Is that the like one words are all cowboys? Yeah, so well, they, yes, they I, go to not America, or I guess okay. it's not America. It is just regular America. America. They go to it's New York America. City. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, don't know, actually know anything about soccer wars. Yeah, so the Sagata Sanchiro commercial. <laughs> so I actually did play that one. That's the only one that officially came to the the to uh, the to the U.S. Of course, um, on a sort of, of limited release. Okay. Yeah, you know the fucking. Um, Tatsunoko versus Capcom of turn-based strategy dating sim vocal uh not vocal uh visual novels. <laughs> I would call it a visual novel slash dating sim first and like a, and then a tactical strategy, strategy game like uh <laughs> at a far distant uh third part of that. But uh yeah, so I think the one that came out here was Soccer Wars 4, and I also think it's generally considered to be by far the worst one. <laughs> <laughs> ah, but even so, I enjoyed it quite a bit. So I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what may actually be a good Soccer Wars yeah. game. I um, mean, in all seriousness, like Soccer Wars kind of represents, you know, one of the you could say one of the pillars of that '90s era of kind of anime kitchen sink settings. You know, it's yeah. Like, I was reading about them, and I was reading about it, and I was like, I knew there were mechs, and I knew there was dating stuff, and but then also it was like. And also their idols, and also there's magic and, and demons. Like, demons. And it's just and I was like, okay, yeah, it's, tell me more. It's, it's just one on. of those, uh, yeah, one of those settings from you know. I feel like this happened a lot. I mean, maybe this is just rose tinted glasses. I don't even necessarily say this is a good thing, but like, it definitely seems like back in the day, uh, a lot of anime franchises were just willing to kind of just throw everything in just to see what stuck. If that well, makes sense. I mean, now you're in an alternate world, and you have a cheat skill, and you can level up like it's an RPG, and you have a slave who wants to <laughs> stay your slave, and you have a little sister, and, uh, <laughs> and you also well, God, sh- you also showed up in another world with your smartphone. So okay, look, I mean, I'm not gonna say Soccer Wars is fucking clean of this shit. All right, usually in these games, like I'm not super familiar, but like the general trend is like of the girls you meet, you have like the the traditional japanese good girl you uh-huh. have the tomboy mm-hmm. you have the like uh older elegant one okay who is also sometimes a foreigner uh you have the one who is usually explicitly... you just you just have every character from kotobuki yeah, yes what you have one that is usually explicitly stated to be 13 or 14 years old <laughs> because this was still from that time period of anime uh-huh. they don't want to even say that time period that's still happening now still but happening. 
don't get twisted. <laughs> yeah. So the the one I played was going for like the more international flavor because it was set in New York City. Right. right. So, so like the, the girls I know were the one like, dressed like a cowboy. Yeah, so the, the main girl was the one dressed like a cowboy. She was a she was a weeb from Texas who carried a samurai sword. Um, <laughs> uh, that and, one. Um, so th- there was that. I'm trying to quick, remember. Quick it's tangent, been a while. Quick t- two second tangent. And yes. right, the ninja Super Sentai from a couple of years ago, the sixth ranger. Oh, the cowboy was a Japanese cowboy uh, from America who transformed with a guitar sword. And also a cheeseburger morpher. <laughs> yeah, a cheeseburger, right? <laughs> anyway, continue. Yes, uh, it, it, it's that kind of mashup because she's. And I, I remember, pl- well, when I played it, it was dubbed, but she had an awful Texas accent. And, uh, that's uh, too bad. It sounds had, great. Uh, <laughs> but she had like she had like a horse and a cowboy hat and a samurai sword because she was really into Japan. And then sure. uh, she, she was the main. Cowboy. She was the main girl, but I think I'm trying to remember the other cast members. There was like. This cool black lady who was a lawyer from Harlem. Yeah, um, all right. <laughs> there was, cool. uh, I think, the thirteen-year-old girl was uh, like a little Mexican girl in a poncho and sombrero. <laughs> um, okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> and then they had, uh, oh, there was so the Japanese girl was actually like this like stoic androgynous girl in a suit. As you do. Um, okay. Uh, there was a girl in a wheelchair. Uh, okay. I think. And, and that's all I can uh, remember. You know, it's, it's like those fucking go, you'd go to like Burger King or whatever in the mid nineties, and oh, they'd have the, like a multicultural <laughs> squad on their cups. Yeah, or yeah, yeah, I remember those. Oh man! Yeah, so they're, they're right. trying to like, like you usually have. You know, you fucking have like the black kid with glasses and also in a wheelchair just to like mm-hmm. you know Cover because many, many bases all in one. Uh, yeah, yeah, because, because you know corporate designers are lazy and they just wanted to hit every checkbox in one character. So uh, yeah, so um, yeah, looking forward to that. Or yeah. you know, we'll see if it's actually good or not. But at the very least, uh, I'd I'd put that up there with like like what we we keep t- we keep talking about the uh, the cursed game list here. That's another one to check off, I guess. I mean, <laughs> my understanding point- is that Sega ran a poll a couple of years ago of like what franchise do fans want to see come back, and Soccer Wars was at the top. Valkyria Chronicles three. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, four did so well. I'm sure they'll. Uh, uh, you did me. get four. Like, At least Ace yeah. Combat Seven sold well. So one of my fucking mm. pet niche uh, Japanese franchises is doing okay these days. I mean, uh, at this point, we could hope for any. I mean, what are we gonna get? Like Mother Three on Switch, or like oh, maybe stop. like I don't Borderlands know, Three. I don't know. Oh, wait. now that Reggie Pizza <laughs> may quit, maybe they'll finally. Maybe he was like the fucking seal. That prevented Mother <laughs> Three from coming out. Nintendo's been broken. Yeah, yeah. Now <laughs> that now that he's gone, all bets are off. We're uh, Mother Three getting... can be unleashed upon the world. Wild Arms. We'll get the uh, the, the. They're f- never bringing back Wild Arms. We we'll get the the Philips CDI Zelda games now. Oh. <laughs> uh. All right, we've gone on. We've gone long enough with our anime game tangent here. Let's talk about actual anime, I guess. Sure. Uh, so uh, we, we've reached the end of the winter 2019 season, and it's time to give our final or finalish thoughts on the shows we've been talking about over the season. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess before we do that, let's introduce ourselves. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, eight, almost, nine so, minutes into this uh, podcast. I, I, I'm, I'm really idea. getting I'm really getting lazy with those lately. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, so yeah, I'm Jell, and uh, with me today, uh, as always, we have Iro. Hi. And we have G. I no longer require that name. I have ascended beyond it. Uh, Shinobi requires no name. <laughs> Look, we already did our Japanese <laughs> game oh, tangent. Yeah. You can't start a Sekiro tangent almost <laughs> 10 minutes into the Let podcast. Let me finish, damn you. <laughs> <laughs> Look, man, Sekiro is real good, y'all. And just to barely tie it into anime, it is like totally cop and hard from Dororo. So yeah, I I I haven't really heard anybody mention that personally. I'm sure somebody I, has, but I wonder if I should write that article because I wonder if that's still a fresh take because I haven't seen anybody say that. Am yeah. I the only? Am I the Venn diagram? Right, of, right in the Anime News Network or 
<laughs> or maybe the like, Gorilla blog. Or, or Waypoint. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> look, I'm just saying, am I the only person that exists in this weird Venn diagram of from software fans and is also watching the Roro Row this season? I mean, I'm kind of somewhere on the edge of that Venn diagram. True, true. But just I am surprised I have not seen somebody just write that article of how Sekiro is just taking large swaths of its inspiration from uh Dororo. Yeah. Um or maybe just nobody's watching Dororo, but <laughs> that's probably the more accurate uh yeah. take there. <laughs> well, well, we'll get to Dororo in a minute, but uh yeah, so let's uh let's go through and uh you know basically mop up the the winter season here. We'll talk about uh the shows that are we've been watching this whole season, we've been talking about it on the podcast, so kind of the same ones. And uh, let's start with uh, Mob Psycho 100. Hell yeah, good. Um, since we last left off, they they we left off right as they were entering the, the kind of the final arc, where we you know Mob got his house burned down, and it, you know all the the old characters were showing up, and you know our our real villain uh showed up and um and bones turned on the sakuga faucet yeah for like multiple <laughs> episodes of really impressive holy uh, shit <laughs> fights um i've just just big picture i've overall loved everything they've been doing with this final arc like especially uh, and it's, it, obviously the the animation is in top notch especially like the the fight with the teleporter guy which we can get into a second but uh you know obviously the the main highlight being for me anyway mob's development where he's now just like this badass like dropping truth bombs all over the place but he I... still <laughs> he still hasn't like lost his but he's still like he's still a good a, kid kid but he's yeah. also like not putting up with you know everything that he's been putting up with the for the entire yeah, series no, totally. it, it's I, a uh, great payoff um yeah i i totally agree i uh i was i was talking with ero about this the other day like uh obviously the fights yes the fights are fucking amazing holy shit bones just can can any fucking studio do what bones can these days like just i don't know maybe uh, I don't know, maybe Mappa with a movie budget or something, but like, Jesus Christ, just multiple episodes in a row, just turning it on in a way that is just jaw dropping, like it, just the sheer fucking talent they can bring to the table and just, I don't know, I, I go as far as say, you know, there are definitely, I think parts of Mob here that definitely surpass even season one of One Punch Man, if we were going to like compare in terms of like similar types of, you know, action spectacle. But I think really one of the more impressive things is how well they've pulled off Mob's character development over these past two seasons. You know, just how much he's changed since episode one. Like, you think back to like back then and he's just kind of like this, he's kind of like this very passive cipher to the world, right? Where he is constantly reactive. He is constantly, you know, reacting to things and being told what to do. And even in the climax of season one, like it's him. It's him turning over his agency to Reagan. Yeah, yeah. And now he's like, he's still that good kid we've always known him to be. But also he's realized that, you know, in many ways, inaction and passivity are just as bad as, you know, or, or can be can be as harmful as bad acts themselves. And that, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a very tired trope, but, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. And he is coming to wield that power with the, I think, with the maturity that is, that, that it requires. Yeah, I think one of the, because there was a lot of standout, like, dialogue in the past like two episodes or so uh but uh one of them was that stood out to me was like when uh the what is the evil spirit guy mogami what i think was his name gets released and before he disappears he's like you know kind kindness alone doesn't cut it and you need to be hard on people sometimes <laughs> and, right yeah and I, I think that was like i mean obviously that dude was like evil or whatever but there was truth in that in that you know some you know <laughs> mob's way wasn't working before where yeah. you know he he can't just you know if he has the ability to stop some of these things you know he can't just stand there and watch he needs to you know take action and he certainly does 
Um, yeah, holy <laughs> crap, does he? <laughs> um, uh, and yeah, I, we talked about I just talking about the, the kind of wrapping up the fights part. I particularly like the fight with the teleporter guy, which didn't even involve mob, but like kind of all the no, but man, all the side characters teaming up to take him down, and oh, just some of the and then Reagan just decks him in the face. <laughs> <laughs> of course, yeah. I mean, you know, it also at its core, Mob Psycho 100 is also a fantastic comedy. So, yeah, I'm glad that they don't lose those aspects of it, even even here when things have gotten, you know, uh, quote unquote serious. And uh, I, uh, uh, yeah, just all those camera shifts and just like all these like really beautiful, seamless transitions from character to character doing their thing. It's fucking hats off to Bones, man. They yeah. I, I am. That is a studio that does not settle. <laughs> yeah, I am surprised. I have not seen more screen caps of Reagan with a gun going around. <laughs> that seems like easy meme material. Like I don't know exactly what the joke would be there, but I feel like somebody could have done something with that. I mean, it's already a meme to just like as a response of why did you post this or whatever. Just post somebody holding a gun at the camera. So yeah, maybe I think that's yes, a meme. Yes. I mean, look, I mean, look, yes, I am. There are undoubtedly a million good jokes you could come up with just with a picture of Reagan holding a gun. So yeah, so, hopefully the so, internet gets around. To somebody that get on that. <laughs> somebody get on that. But uh, please do. Yeah. So I, you know, I've, I love the fights. I love the message. The one thing that I am disappointed in, in this final arc is the actual villain is super lame. Like I, I'm not feeling him at all. Like it's so like, uh, like I, I, I don't feel like there's any like creative angle or anything to his whatever. He's just like a dude, just like right? a really powerful dude who doesn't who's yeah. not gonna rely on myself and like I feel like there's nothing like there. I mean, hasn't it always been kind of the message of Mob Psycho 100 is that all the villains are like just deeply childish, selfish people who are like just caught up in delusions of their own grandeur, you know, that they, they let themselves become defined by their powers, which is like, you know, the exact opposite of what mob is trying to be. Yeah. But I feel like they found like slight, like at least different types of angles to take, like even like the umbrella guy, like I felt like was more interesting as a villain. I guess that's true. Yeah. This guy who's just like, Nope, I'm really strong and I'm only going to rely on myself. Um, I think they're supposed to be like dark mirrors to Bob and Reagan, like yeah. the umbrella guy and the the, the boss. There was a little bit, but of like that. it doesn't it doesn't really pan out super well. Because yeah, Reagan has like nuance to him, right? Like he's yeah. he's, both yeah. a, he's both a kind of a con man and a dirt bag, but also he's also has a nice guy side to him. You know, there's like. Mm-hmm you know, some depth there where I, and I, I, we should point out, uh, we're recording this before the final ep- episode at 13 airs. So maybe, yes. maybe there, there'll be more, but I don't know. I'm not really sure what else they're going to be able to do in one more episode to make that part more interesting. But, mm-hmm. um, I don't know. I, I guess if that, that, that's just one thing that stood out to me that I wasn't so thrilled about, but in the long run, probably not that big a deal because they're the, you know, the main, the important thing is mobs development and they're doing a good job with that. So, um, yeah, I guess we'll see how episode 13 goes and, you know, hopefully they'll land on their feet and, you know, we can kind of declare mob one of the, the, the best, uh, <laughs> the best shows of the season. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I certainly hope so. I mean, everything, I mean, yes, we haven't seen the last episode yet, but Man, everything it's shown up till now has me feeling real good about about that show as a whole. So yeah, okay. So let's uh, move along then to our next show. We already briefly talked about Dororo, and just as a point of order, that is continuing next season. So we're this is more of a mid mid season checkup, I guess. Um, yeah, I never got a chance to catch up with it, so you guys are gonna have to fill me in. How's that been? Uh, mm-hmm. It's sure. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, that's. I feel like. Yeah, yeah. I. Dororo has kind of settled into a pace and a formula that is not in and of itself a bad thing, but I think. 
I think I think I think Dororo just doesn't have the resources or talent it needs to really make it shine. Yeah. Like it, it's it it's settled into a formula and it's a very kind of average formula, like For both mid, in terms of execution. Kind of show. And, yeah, yeah. Like the fights on average don't look that great anymore like you know episode one looked ever, great. i mean episode one looked pretty good and the the last episode has a couple pretty good looking occasion, it occasionally it gets pretty but good. like i think what i think we're beginning to realize is that i think maybe dororo has perhaps erased too much of the tezuka charm yeah from from its you know inspiration from its origins like i think there's nothing wrong with trying to play the dororo story straight but Without that kind of Tezuka style, you know, just charm and like nuance that he had, like we're kind of we're kind of left in a weird place with it. Like especially here with the end of, I guess it's uh, current season. Like the character developments here towards the end kind of feel rushed. Like like it initially introduces some kind of interesting, you know, kind of moral dilemmas for its kind of a. Uh, I guess Hyakumaru's kind of rival slash brother, um, what is it, Tahomaru? Mm-hmm. Like, initially he's kind of presented as kind of this reluctant, you know, not necessarily villain, but like, he's somebody who's caught between obligation and his own sense of, like, morality. And he kind of struggles with that initially. And then, like, a 30-second conversation happens, and then he fully shifts to pure bad guy. And it just right. kind of... It's. I'm not even asking like, oh, I want like you know, I want really deep characterization out of my fucking you know, Sengoku era demon hunting anime. But like, if you're gonna set up this character as initially like morally you know misguided or like caught in a place, you know, then don't fucking then resolve that in like the span of a minute. You know, it just it feels cheap. It feels it doesn't feel earned. I guess. Yeah, and I think that kind of tie that that's just kind of indicative of the kind of greater framework issues around Dororo. Yeah, it's just kind of a really plain kind of show, I guess. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, it it's kind of just become, I guess, predictable, maybe like dry or something. I mean, like you, just, I mean, it's you guys said it's basically settled into a pattern, right? Like, yeah, yeah, like. It kind of says like, a lot it's that just like extremely middle of the road. Yeah, it kind of says a lot that the titular Dororo um, himself is like kind of one of the only anchors that show has, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like yeah. because that's the one <clears throat> character who has kind of you know retained most of their original personality, you know, from the uh, the original, but everything else is kind of. Yeah, just kind of settled into, like, it's not, like, realistic or dark are not necessarily bad things to do with a show, like, thematically, but I think the worst thing you can do is not have a personality at all, and I feel like that's kind of where Dororo is dangerously veering into. It's like they decided it had to be, like, serious, or, or like, taken seriously, and so they drained some of the personality out of it. Yeah, I mean, I think it speaks volumes that... To this day, we keep saying that the Dororo opening is the version of this anime that we want. <laughs> like that is, that is the promise of what right. this anime could have been that we don't really get. Right. And what I'm saying is Takeshi Koike should have directed the whole series, not just the opening. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds, I mean, a little disappointing, I guess. I mean, do you think any of it has to do with them, like, stretching it out over two seasons or... I, no. I mean, they have to cover the I manga, mean, I guess, but. there is kind of a convoluted, contrived thing that happens at the end of this season. And it almost feels like when they started writing the show, they thought they had one core, and then at some point got told, oh, no, we got two cores, and had to, like, come up with <laughs> an excuse. Right, because, like, there's another, like, plot element that happens that's kind of contrived and doesn't necessarily come out of nowhere, but is, like, very just, like, it it, it, it is introduced in the very episode that it is executed. And it's like, oh no, the demons are stronger again. And it's like, uh, okay, I, 
I don't. You, you didn't could really build could up to this. More but... demons in the first place. Right. Right. It's. It's weird. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, you, still mild, mildly enjoyable. Are you gonna? Yeah, planning on sticking it out for the uh, second season? I'll, I'll, I'll stick it out. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to see how it ends at this point, right? I mean, it, that manga has never been properly ended, right? So <laughs> yeah, every version seems to have its own ending. So, all right, I'm, I'm curious at least. Well, maybe we'll we'll check back in next season and see if uh, things mm-hmm. improve, but. Yeah, it sounds kind of disappointing at this point. All right. Let's, uh... <laughs> All right, so I'm, I'm interested to hear what ha- what happened with the next show. Here. <laughs> uh, again, this is also uh, waiting on one more episode airing. We're yes. recording Saturday, yeah. so airing tomorrow on Sunday. But uh, the Magnificent Kotobuki... Um, how's, uh, yeah, we, how's that been going? We went from a talking... We went from talking about a show that's like has no personality because it's too serious to show that maybe has a little too much personality for its own good. <laughs> That's a good description. It's like, Kotobuki is unabashedly, it's like weird anime girls hanging out and also fucking as many planes as we can put in there. Just, we fucking love planes. We're going to put some planes in. Are they going to do dogfighting? Check out these planes. We don't give a fuck what you think. What's the plot? Oh, planes. are there planes involved? Okay, there better be planes involved in the plot. <laughs> yeah, like, it's, it, it, it doesn't care. Yeah, and, it's just kind of a thin justification for as many fucking dogfights like, as they can stuff into this show. And there's, like, a mobile game attached to this, right? So yeah. Half the character, new half these new characters show up, and they're all, like, scantily clad women. Like, right, big, they, like, it's like they literally... Girls. Yeah, like it's corsets like, and stuff. These these characters. I mean, it's like here's the thing. Like the original like main cast are like say what you will, but they're just kind of your standard like cute anime girls fluff, right? They're not like that right. egregious overall, like you know. But then these new characters yeah, walk right, the, in. Like, mysterious Ace, who has been right. around the whole show, gets out of their plane and saw so like hot, hot dark skin lady wearing her like corset that shows I mean, off her boobs. The way, and, the way I want to put it is. <laughs> I want to wait. I want to put it is these characters look like they walked right out of a fucking five star role. Like, <laughs> like, like they kind of have that elaborate kind of sexier vibe that like that tier of character gets in a gotcha game. If that makes After sense. You uncap uh-huh. the character three times and they get their, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, like, yeah. like the costume gets more elaborate and like, you know, the, the skin, you know, the, this slightly more skin is showing each time it's, All the- but, uh, Sorry, go ahead, Jill. They do, they do have the the Kotobuki Gacha game, right? They gotta. Yeah, yeah. It. Well, fucking. When are my fucking jazz girls and phantom thieves showing up? Yeah. Like those are the ones I'm interested in. Yeah. But uh, yeah, in terms yeah. of the show itself, like it's taken this really kind of. I mean, so we were talking about this whole season of like, where is this show going? Like, what is it trying? What kind of story is it even trying to tell? And the story it seems to arrive at is some kind of like weird r- hyper capitalist resource war. Like, okay, one city state has basically become this like hyper capitalist <clears throat> monopoly on, on like gasoline and on stuff. gas and planes, and more importantly, the isekai portal that leads to Japan. Right. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Thing, yes. Yeah. That is how they the got thing, their planes and, and their what, seaweed and shit. I yeah, guess. Yeah, and there's straight up just like trying to grab as much land as they can because you can mathematically predict where the portal shows up and they want to monopolize it and any city where the portal opens up and doesn't acquit their demands just gets firebombed yeah yeah and and so you know kind of the ending is like oh it's the kotobuki girls and all the like you know ragtag misfits and pirates and brigands who still believe that in freedom and freedom because <laughs> when you close your eyes and you think of the skies, <laughs> what color do you see? <laughs> see a you dark know, blue. You know, what is a nation uh, up here in the skies? <laughs> there are no borders up here. Uh, All right. Yeah. Thank you for allowing me to just quote Ace Combat a couple times. But, uh, but yeah, so like, but what that really does is just create an excuse for dog fights and, Lots of dog fights and really still pretty good dog fights. Like, 
I guess you could argue, like, you know, in a way, this show is definitely showing the strength of CG in one regard. At least, you know, not with the characters, but at least with the planes. Is like, when you don't have to, like, you know, animate the plane every single time and you just have a model, you could just fucking animate fucking right. three dozen planes going at it. And yeah. it it's cool. Like, the, the penult- like, the last episode we just watched, I guess the penultimate episode, is kind of just a 15-minute dogfight. <laughs> like... Yeah, and it's the show is unabashed about how much it loves its planes. It is just so on its brand of bullshit, and like even you know, and like and it does the most like on its brand of bullshit thing possible, where like all these planes are like based on like you know real Japanese you know, right. World War II the, planes, the, 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 like they're fight like getting the upper hand against the bad guys, but then the main bad guy shows up, who is said to be a former ace, right, and he's busting out this fucking super experimental fucking Japanese prototype plane of which only two of were ever built in <laughs> our like world. Red prototype super plane. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wish I could remember the name of the plane off the top of my head, but plane enthusiasts will know what they're what I'm talking about. It's the it's the uh, it's the prototype uh, Japanese World War II plane with the uh, the rear mounted propeller instead of the front mounted propeller. And uh, just the thing is that this was a real plane. Like they're not like they're not a uh, you know they're not exaggerating at all. Like this is so the, the actual Jin fucking Den. plane. Uh, yes, I think so. Um, and like they just bust that out. And because the show has been entirely about real planes, when that thing shows up, you're <laughs> like, oh shit. <laughs> well, sounds uh, yeah. sounds yeah. like it stayed fun at least. Um, it's yeah, it's continued to broadly entertain in a way that <laughs> yeah i don't know if i'd necessarily call it good but it's no but you know it, it knows what it wants to do and it's just gonna do it yeah everyone else be damned so it you know, truly there's nothing else quite like it admire their commitment at the very least yeah um all right. I mean, is there anything interesting happening in like the final arc here for the final episode to, to look forward to? Know, or? They, they might go. They might go to Japan. Yeah, my guess is either they go to Japan or something. I mean, I don't know. Like, look, th- this fucking anime is just some real fucking ace combat shit. <laughs> it's just gonna end with a badass one on one dog fight, and like anything that happens afterwards is perfunctory at best. <laughs> So is is uh is it currently World War Two era in Japan that they're going to, or we don't know? I don't know. I I mean, look, that is always like the. I mean, I've said this even since the fuck the first episode. Like, there's well, always going to be yeah. that. Well, the weird... hole open and a modern jet flies in. Right. There's that kind of weird specter of World War Two Japan kind of hovering in the background that. I yeah. frankly hope they never actually address because the moment they actually try to address it is going to open itself up to criticism. Whereas I think, at least my hope is that these are just plain fans, you know, who just want mm-hmm. to show off cool planes and that they are not going to try and get into the, uh, the politics of it. I certainly hope not. I don't think this show is nearly equipped to pull that off. I was going to say it'd be but, a little uh, weird. As Nero said, they, it'd be a little weird if they like popped into 1945 or something. There would be some. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that'd, that'd be so bad. That- that's some territory that doesn't sound like the show is prepared to handle. <laughs> but, uh, no, I certainly don't think so. But as Eero said, I think the funnest, the best twist would be that like 40, 50 years have passed in real Japan since the last time the portal opened up. And just like a real, like a real fucking F-16 or something just flies through that portal. Right. You know, just a, a real ass jet. But, you know. All right. We will see. Well, I'm, you know, I'm glad you guys at least got some enjoyment out of that because it certainly did not look like <laughs> that was going to be the case when we when we were previewing it. So no, but it's somehow somehow I found a way, I guess somehow wormed its way into our hearts. So <laughs> all right, uh, let's move along then to Kakagurui, uh Double Cross. I'm not sure if I should call it that now because I know what the X's mean. Um, oh no! What do me was is it kisses? No, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. So, 
<laughs> oh man, I am so ready for this. We have not heard Jell's Kakagurui corner in weeks. Yes, yeah, so I'm gonna try to so. keep this condensed because there were two battles since uh, the last time we talked, and the first one was uh, it was the president's uh, super gay secretary who was very much in love with her and was uh, getting extremely jealous at the president obsessing over Yumiko, and uh, she finally lost it after Yumiko, uh, the president said something to the line. Some some line to the effect of "I can't wait till Yumiko stirs up my insides" or something like that. Um, <laughs> so, okay. but she totally lost it at that point and 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 said, "I've had enough of I've had enough of Yumiko having her way with this school and everything. I'm challenging you right now. This doesn't even have to do with the election. This is personal, and I'm betting oh, my man. very life on this gamble." And oh shit, and Yumiko's like. Really? Is that all you got? I bet my life, like, you know, that's just like a Tuesday for me. Like, you got to do better. <laughs> you got to do better, than, better that. than that. So they end up betting. Um, uh, the, so good. The stakes are the, the secretary bets all of her memories and relationship with the president. Uh, and, wait, okay. how? And, uh, and Yumiko uh, swears that she will no longer, she will give up gambling if she loses, which is the most important oh, thing man. Oh no! Uh, the most precious thing to her. And so the game. So the president's like, "Okay, this sounds cool. I have a game for you." And she takes them to this elaborate uh, tower in the middle of nowhere that that oh, they man. actually say in the like in the dialogue. Yumiko is like, "Wow, this tower serves absolutely no purpose other than this one gambling game. <laughs> like it strictly exists for that purpose." Oh, that's and so it turns good. into like okay. a zero escape scenario where they have to figure out how to get out of the tower without dying. Um, and uh, I don't I just the, the short version is Yumiko uses the angle of the moon to calculate how the tower was rotating to find the right door or something like that. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> it's zero escape. Shit. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then it, Do this math in base 13. It ends with, Does ice nine come up? It yeah. ends with uh, the president and the, the secretary rolling around in a literal field of lilies and it, it gets super gay at the end, which is, which is fine. But, uh, right. So how did she give up her memories? Like, well, <laughs> do they have a machine that extracts memories? Like, about that. They're like, oh, basically, you're just going to die anyway. So it ended up being about her life. So they had her jump off the top of the tower. Uh oh, uh, but uh, but OK, but the, I guess the entire tower was surrounded by like safety mats or something hidden under the flowers. And so like the president's like, OK, well, I don't know who you are anymore, but now let's be friends. And they start like almost making out. Um Anyway, that was that. St- that was wait. Wh- wh- yeah, let's, let's just move on from that one. And then what? Like, yeah, go ahead. So, so the the final battle, and I should point out. So there has been no announcement for season three, but they explicitly say that this is only the midway point of the big tournament thing. So I, I would be shocked if we don't get another season three in the near future. So is it going to be Kakagurui XXX? Is that no, what we're going with this? No, I don't think so because we, we kind oh, of find no, out because of we the... kind of find out what the X's are, and they don't explicitly state this. But um, oh, if you man. recall, I kept saying you saying to you guys, I'm pretty sure the butler is the real bad guy, the butler girl. Sure. And so, sure enough, uh, she plays her hand in in uh, the, in the final battle where uh, you know she reveals that. Uh, part of the, part of the reason she dressed up as a butler is to smooth talk all the girls who are not really competing in the competition to take their their voting chips and amass this huge amount of chips to take down. Uh, wait, wait. So is she is she like is she cross dressing and everybody thinks she's a guy or is she like? I'm not really clear just on a that. Female butler. I'm not really clear on that, and I don't think it really matters because either way, all the girls were in love with her. Um, okay, yeah, but I buy it because I don't think they ever really I'm say there's ever been a barrier in this show. In no, the past. no, I'm not acting like yeah, you know, yeah, oh, know, it's know. gotta be this way. I was just, yeah, curious no, they, they like, never, well, she actually, I don't think they everybody, ever, or I don't think they ever really specify because, like, because, like, when, when she does kind of her big reveal that she's, she's the one behind everything or whatever, then, uh, everyone's more shocked at that and nobody really cares about, like, oh, she actually looks like a girl now. But, uh, but I mean, this butler is voiced by Romy Park, yes. right? So, like, the thing with the thing with the Romy Park role is deepest it's always voice hard to tell. Like, what, the deepest voice woman in anime. Yes. Yeah, well, it's not. I mean, it's it's more like it's always hard to tell like when she's voicing a character, especially an androgynous character. Yeah. 
Is she doing the Romy Park playing a woman pretending to be a man role? <laughs> the Romy Park actually playing a man role? Or one of the multitude other are like those, variables that come into are play? Are those different voices, though? I mean, she has, I, vo- she has voiced many men and many women. Yeah, she has voiced a, okay. a pl- plenty of male characters. So, voiced like, a man you know. in Turn A Gundam. Yeah. And in Full Metal Alchemist. She doesn't uh she doesn't change her voice at any point with this particular role, so. Okay. Um sure. anyway, uh so th- th- I was kind of a little disappointed the actual game they play is kind of lame. It's just like this auction house thing where they have to like psych each other out on how much money they bet or whatever. So there was no like elaborate uh Wait, what? Oh, just no, no elaborate, no elaborate game, is... but there was a lot of theatrics when uh she does her big reveal, which I think I linked I'll, I'll I'll link that clip in the notes. Here, right. But like she like throws off her glasses black angel wings. and there's like a big screen where like black angel wings like appear behind her. Yeah, like her that. her her kind of her kind of final yes. fantasy true form boss reveal. Right. Uh, moment. Like yeah, one winged angel starts playing. Which I might add, she does after uh, Yumiko calls her out and and one ups her bet by having. Uh, like all like a dozen officials bring in like a dozen cases of money adding up to three billion yen, which is a real baller move. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, so she she reveals she's the so she reveals that, uh, you know, did I ever explain? Oh, man, this show. <laughs> oh, did man. I ever explain how all the new characters were all basically from the same like kind of family. Uh, they're, they're, it's like a clan with like multiple families that are like right, well, one is like the like our, our branch just poison right, but they're all like technically related, and it includes the president and Yumiko. They all have like um oh no, they're all the same gambling clan. Yeah, so so like it's it's like the Momobami clan, and they all have like Bami at the end of their their family names. So like Yumiko is Yumiko Jabami, and like they all have like a different right. variation of it. And the president is an actual like pure blood Momobami, who's like the head like the head family or whatever. Okay. So part of the deal of this election is whoever's the head of the student council is also the head of the the clan. So, um, that's why it, okay. it attracted all these different families for season two to like try to win over you know control of the clan. Um, and so the Butler girl is from this family who like lost a bet like centuries ago and have since been like slave, oh, man. who have since been like slaves of the clan basically. But one day we will rise again. And yes, so she, so she has a flat. She gets her little flashback uh, to, uh, you know, the, the the first time anybody showed her any human kindness was this woman who is implied, I think, implied to be Yumiko's mother. They never say it, and maybe they'll talk about that more later. And uh, Yumiko's mother ends up losing in a bet, and she ends up getting killed or something. And Sheesh. and uh, and the the butler girl swears revenge for you know this woman and you know for all the terrible things that have been done to her personally, and uh, the, so the two exes, and again they don't explicitly say this, but I think the visuals kind of say it. She has a black X on each one of her hands, like branded on there because she's a slave. And okay. like at some point, she like holds them up and like the like they like flash. Like she's doing some kind of special move and it makes like two X's on the screen. I'm like, oh, oh boy. that's the X. That's oh, what the two X's man. are. So um so yes, this whole thing was just her elaborate scheme to take control of the the clan and have get her revenge. And uh All right. unfortunately she okay. loses because uh Yumiko doesn't care about any of that. She just likes to gamble. Uh, and she so she beats her. <laughs> Um, mm-hmm. which is kind of an interesting conversation in itself, which I don't think I've ever brought out. Like Yumiko is not really, she's basically like chaotic neutral. Like she does not really care about anything other than like <laughs> gambling. And, uh, and the, the president is kind of the same way. That's why they're like interesting foil characters, I guess. But, uh, it's, it's interesting when your main character is not like a hero by like any means whatsoever. Like she just like, Sure. Yeah. yeah. Just wants I mean, your next fix. Yeah, basically, and uh, so it can certainly be interesting if done well. Which it sounds like Kakagurui does. Well, I'm only taking this at your words. So. <laughs> well, if Kakagurui's goal is to make it a, an extremely entertaining spectacle of itself, um, then yes, it succeeds. And part of that is having this this you know main character who's a total wild card. Um. So yeah. Um. So. 
this is def- th- th- like again i will be shocked if they don't make another season because basically the episode ends with them doing kind of a montage of some of the other battles going on and then like basically saying somebody still needs to beat the president um and you know they, like i said they've explicitly said this is only the halfway point so we'll definitely see more like <laughs> they show shots of like some of the other fights like mary taking on the girl who's only defining characteristic because she has a giant saint bernard um there <laughs> okay okay yes there's there's lots of those things going on and um and they kind of set up so there there's the kind of the the biggest threat to the president is one of these other this other girl in a wheelchair or something that is like the most prominent uh like the next most prominent member in the clan or something and she's like basically the president is crazy because the president is also like chaotic neutral like only cares about gambling like she doesn't care if she's going to lose her seat or not and she's like and so the other girl's like you know we can't have her as the head of the clan so that there's no how does this clan survive i don't know man but the money the uh yeah they apparently <laughs> so have good un- gambling unlimited resources apparently but uh yeah so, th- so there's too many open sh- open threads there that need to be tied up for them to not make more so I am looking forward to season three at some point. It sounds like I'm glad you're having fun with it, Joe. <laughs> Look, it, I yeah, I um, it, it's just so much. Like, if I, like I'm not, I, I, I'm not, like I'm not chastising it. Just yeah, like if I if I had to be honest with myself and like say, would I recommend somebody watch Kakarui? I think there's a very specific type of <laughs> entertainment you get out of it and if that's not what you're looking for it's not going to work for you but, uh, i mean it sounds like it, it, it sounds like it achieves a certain type of spectacle that i wish a certain show we'll be talking about later today had achieved uh, yes but... <laughs> <laughs> yes so at the very so, least it does accomplish I'm glad that. some show pulled it off yeah. i know i've certainly enjoyed sharing with you guys the elaborate uh mm-hmm. just I, explaining uh, will... some of the elaborate games that yeah, I will. I will miss Jell's Kakagurui Corner. You know, I uh, will. I'll, I'll probably never watch this show, but I do enjoy just hearing you try to describe the fucking absurd bullshit that seems to just uh, be that show's DNA. We'll always have Death Macaroon. So, <laughs> all right. Um, moving along, let's talk about my roommate is a cat. Another show, another show that only Joe yes. watched. So, so you will. Know, uh, so, um, I guess maybe predictably, they uh, they kind of turned up the drama a little bit in the final stretch. Um, as they, oh no, the cat dies. No, 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 the it? cat doesn't die. I'll give you that one. Well, we'll, we'll get that out of the way. But uh, okay, they do. They do drive home one final time that. Uh, Basically, everything this guy's parents ever did was for him, and he took them for granted. And now they're dead, and he'll never be able to thank them properly. Uh, oh, mortality! So, um, <laughs> there's a lot of that. He ends up the final <laughs> arc. He ends up going on a trip. So, so basically, he's done with his his book, and he he just can't think of any new books. So his his editor's like, "Let me send you on a trip, and maybe you'll come up with some ideas." Motherfucker wow. finishes book what? in like what, like two weeks? Uh, I think like a year has passed since the start of the show. Uh, oh, a year! Yeah. So that's so fast. Yeah. So uh, he ends up through various circumstances. He ends up deciding to go to the final trip that his parents were going to go to before they were killed in the car accident in the middle of a typhoon from some like driver that fell asleep or something. Um, oh, is that how they died? Yeah. Okay. No, it wasn't like an old age thing. Like they were died. In a okay, accident. that's what I. All right. I guess you never actually. I, yeah, brought I, I, up how I they never died. specified that. So this is like they died very prematurely, type of thing, to make it more tragic. Gotcha. And he and he never got the opportunity. And he and he was always like they were really asking him to go places and stuff. And he was like, eh, whatever. And then you know he took them for granted, and now they're dead. So mm. that's the the fun, the fun major theme running through this show. But uh. <laughs> So yeah, he goes on this trip and the kind of like the final big dramatic moment in the final episode is uh while he's gone, his uh like he can't get he can't get home because there's like a typhoon and it's just like when his parents died and 
his and uh, his. Oh, who will feed the cat? Well, his friend goes to feed the cat, but the cat's like, "I have to save my master," and gets out, gets out, runs outside, and this is this is unrealistic. Yeah. <laughs> now I like I like cats. I think I think cats are very are, are very friendly creatures to interact with. I would like to own a cat someday. No motherfucking cat in the world is this goddamn loyal. No. I, Not at all. <laughs> no cat in the world. You, you could, you could disappear for weeks, months, years. They, they got food. And they're good. As long as that cat's being fed, he's like fucking. All right, whatever, I man. I guess there. I just got a new. It's order. raining. I ain't going out there. But uh, <laughs> exactly. So the cat runs out, and it's up to you know uh, the main guy to rely on his newfound friends to help them help him uh, find the cat, which of course he does. And then you know they all live happily ever after. But um. Yeah, I mean, no, no boss fight against the giant. Crow. No, the crow, no, no, no crows since then. So, um, you know, I guess they that's no longer a problem. But uh, or 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 I guess crows aren't a problem in the middle of a typhoon. But uh, sure. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, overall, I I I I enjoyed watching it. Um, it was something kind of, you know, I I, I played up some of the tragic stuff, but the you know. The day the day to day average episode is usually very light light hearted and just kind of nice and sweet. Sure, and light and I guess something comforting in these dark times to watch. Yeah, no, it sounds like a nice palate cleanser uh, of an anime, and I think that you know sometimes we just need a show like that. Yeah, just uh, something we don't have to something you don't have to worry about getting too wound up around, but uh, is just. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it, something you can watch. kind of glib as I was being about the ending being traumatic or whatever. It, it was still pretty effective. I mean, like, I, you know, I wasn't like, you know, breaking down in tears or anything. But, you know, I was invested enough where I felt like it was a satisfying ending. No, for yeah. sure. It, it sounds like that show. Again, I didn't watch it. But the way you described it, it sounds like that show was another another one that kind of like had a goal in mind, had its scope in mind and kind of just set out to achieve it. Yep. So... Uh, so yeah, I, I think, I think if you're, you're looking for that type of show where you want something a little more lighthearted and, uh, you know, just something to chill with, I would recommend it. Um, moving on to a show that is definitely not chill. Oh yeah. Oh, Time baby, we've been waiting for this segment. to talk about yeah. the promised Neverland. All right, everybody, set aside 30 minutes. This podcast is going to be a two-hour one All right, because uh, we're going to talk about the themes, the politics, and the socio uh, sociological uh, implications of The Price of Smiles. <laughs> Doing The Promised Neverland first. Oh, I'm sorry. I got them mixed up. My bad. Sorry. So you're talking about <laughs> sorry. I was, I was like, why are you so excited? What? Oh, well, the way Jell was talking, I thought we were about to talk about the bad show, not the good show. My bad. I, I was saying it's a show with no chill, which The Promise Neverland definitely has no chill. But well, The uh, Price of Smiles also has no chill. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's why I, I'm sorry. They both start with P. Can you blame me? Yes. Damn it. I ruined a perfectly good bit. They're both, oh, well. they're both of the P, yes. But, uh, All right, fine. Let's do the Promise Neverland first. Let's do the Promise Neverland first, and then yes, I, I, yeah. I have been much, I have very much been anticipating hearing you guys cut loose on the final, uh, oh boy, uh, the final price. Oh uh, yeah, but yeah, the, but, uh, uh, the, the Promise Neverland. Um, yeah, they, the, yeah, they made good on the promise of the start of the show, I guess. Like, uh, yeah, like, God, they got out. <laughs> yes, I don't know yeah. where it goes from here. I still actually I do know a little bit because I started reading the manga, <laughs> but so you know what manga you should be reading if you have time to read manga uh, is uh is the is uh it's getting an anime soon but I highly recommend reading the manga it's called uh it's called a uh, Beast Stars, mm-hmm. but in all seriousness um but yeah uh the Promised Neverland you know uh. It does uh, what all good shows about a big escape does, and it pulls off the big escape in the uh, almost the best way possible. You know, it's got all the kind of twists and drama you could hope for. And uh, because overall, I feel like uh, the actual climax of the escape, like pulling, I feel like actually pulling off the escape was the penultimate episode. You know, and then the last episode was just kind of like 
the wrap up of the escape. True, true, yes. But uh I mean I think with this kind of show, right, where so much of it is based more on like at least for now, plots and intrigue. Right. It was much more interesting to see like how do they pull it off, right? right. Like what what are the factors that come into play that we the viewer were not privy to at the time. Yeah. That, I guess what I guess what I'm saying is that last episode is when it felt like because the show is like who can outthink who at this point. Yeah. And so I felt like last week was the definitive we outthought you and we won. You know? Yeah, and totally. There wasn't too much of that this in the last episode. Right. Um, I mean, which, I think, is, I think, which is not to say it's bad or anything. No, but I think you know, I think a, a great aspect of it is like I, I, the the best thing about like when characters are plotting against each other, often you know, like a certain um, famous nineteen eighty eight science fiction OVA. Uh, I'm surprised it took this long for this to come up. I know. I was I was work I was trying to work towards it. I, I was saving it for the price of smiles, but I'm damn willing it. to bust that out here. Oh, but uh, it's it's more that like. When characters plot against each other, when they plan against each other, it's often like, often the best surprises are because one character is operating on completely different parameters from the other. Like, they are willing to accept ideas and paradigms that the other character has not accepted or has not considered, and thus they are not ready to plan for them. And the kind of great thing you see here with, uh, you know, with Mama versus the kids is like, she severely underestimates the uh, the the physical uh, lengths they are willing to go to, right? To uh, to trick her, you know, and uh, you know, I mean, like, I had I had almost forgotten because, uh, uh, for better or worse, uh, both Ray and Emma, uh, even well into the manga, have character have, have hairstyles that cover their hair, but uh, right, like Emma fucking cut her ear off. Like Ray does they too. spent so like, much time talking about like the device that disables yeah. the thing, so that when she actually no, just fucking no, it's a great red herring. Cuts like, it off like geez. like they kind of build up to this idea of like oh like the moment we disable the tractor the, the the trackers they'll know and we have to build around that plan. But it's like actually no, like motherfucker, we were never planning to disable the trackers to begin with. We were gonna take the fucking. I think everyone else they still disabled them right, but. Maybe, yeah, yeah. I think. Well, hmm, that's a good point. I'm, I'm not actually. I guess, I guess that's a good point. Actually, yes, because when Mama is, is running after them, she doesn't know where to go immediately. She just knows they're on the wall, and by that point, I guess yes, both Ray and Emma have already removed uh, their trackers through the most traumatic method possible. So, well, they needed to. Um, they needed. They needed to have uh, Mama think they were still in the house, right? So. Like- Right. Had, I mean, that's that, could, that's the great thing about that they, plot, they had, right? They couldn't disable theirs. Yeah. They had to... Yeah, like, their plot hinges on them keeping the trackers working because, again, that's the paradigm that Mama is operating right. under, is that either the trackers are working or the trackers are not working. She has never considered the trackers are working but are no longer attached to the people that, uh, that, that they are a part of. So, right. so uh, gee, I have a question... As someone who has read the yeah. manga, did they rush anything or make any dramatic changes to hit this point by episode 12? Or is this um, about the pace you were expecting? This is about the pace I was expecting. I assumed no matter what, season one was going to end with the escape. It had to. Yeah. Now, that said, I haven't read the early parts of the manga in a while. I'm sure there are some fans out there who are uh, screaming at me right now saying... That, uh, no, the anime totally forgot such and such. Um, for me, the thing I've always felt the anime has kind of missed compared to the manga is it kind of how effectively the manga uh, sets a sense of uh, of dread in in the story. Like, because I've said it before, but because manga can be in black and white, they can use darks and lights in more dramatic, interesting ways than the anime can. Right. right and, like the like, anime is just like it's at night half the time. It's just, everything's dark all the time. Right, like, the only way they ever portray Mama as, like, scary is when her pupils get really small and she gets, like, that real angry-ass looking look on her face. Whereas, like, in the manga, Mama is terrifying for plenty of other reasons, uh, or, or with plenty of other expressions and ways she's framed with, like, lighting in the panels. Like, beyond just, oh, she's got a scary face, you know? It's, 
You know, it's Mama wearing this black and white uniform, you know, silhouetted against black or white backgrounds that, like, are super effective at setting the sense of, like, how how much uh, Emma and Ray and Norman actually feared Mama that is not as well established in the anime. But pacing-wise, I think they did what needed to be done to get to uh, to get to the point they had to. Right. Yeah, I, I had heard some people complaining about some of the choices they made for the anime, but I didn't really investigate. So I was just wondering if you had any other input. I know we talked about that part kind of last time, but um, yeah, I, I couldn't see how they could get away with ending any ending with anything. It else. had to end with the escape. Like there's, yeah. there's, there's no other way to yeah, do that it. That would have been way too. And, uh, 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 to be clear, they did announce after the episode aired there will be a second season in 2020. Yeah. So there will yeah, be more. So, uh, but even so, sure. they need yeah. to end. It will be. <laughs> they need to end with the escape. Um, yeah. Now that everybody has watched the show, um, maybe now I'm allowed to maybe vocalize my concerns with the eventual season two and probably a season three if this continues the same kind of tra- trajectory that most uh, weekly Shonen Jump anime adaptations go. Is that I think. There is a reason why most movies about a big escape end with the escape (laughs) because now the writer is forced to realize, Oh, what do I do now that they've escaped? Right. Like, cause you can't just do the fucking, Oh, the world's a prison, man. We're always (laughs) escaping. Like, that's not really like that. That premise only takes you so far. Right. And isn't that kind of the deal though? Because the, the demons are out there. Yes, yes. I mean, I don't want to get into spoiler territory too much, but there's very much this element of like, oh no, the kids escaped from this, but now they have to escape an even bigger thing, you know? And it's, well, I mean, you put two and two together, and yes, obviously, they're, they're, they're still like surrounded, they're still living in a world where, you know, this... They're, where they're surrounded by flesh-eating demons? Yes. yes. And, and the thematic aspects of the manga it gets into later is very much again it, it starts to get into the now that we escaped what next what how, what does what does our pushback look like what does our resistance look like and what does eventually our rebellion look like and these are the elements I kind of think I think the way I put it before is that the promised Neverland trades its razor sharp focus for increased breadth and scope. And I think some of that works okay, but I also think a lot is lost from that original focus. You know, like like Mama is such a Mama is such a good villain, is such a good, pervasive, effective villain. And there is nobody who ever really takes her place later in the story, in the sense of like like they're obviously villains, but like but they are your more not like, of such a like personal and overbearing yeah presence. yeah and not only that but like the other villains are very much more, more your standard like how do we you know how do we physically overcome this villain whereas there really hasn't been a villain in the promised neverland since mama that has kind of evoked that same sense of like we are literally powerless before her and like right you know, we have to scrounge up a way to win that, like, again, we have to find entirely different paradigms through which to beat her. That right. Yeah, I mean, like, even I think the about, manga doesn't really get into later. In, in one episode, they were even talking about, you know, how do we subdue or even kill Mama? Like, with, but, like, how far does that even get you? Like, it, it there right. was so much. And I feel like so many of the show's strengths were playing off how tight the constraints were. Like, the. They yeah. did really find all the little cracks in their situation that were, you know, seemingly not there. And that was part of the, you know, the intrigue of it all is like, how are they going to, yeah. you know, I could see how some of that tension might be lost in a broader, you know, larger setting. Um, so I guess it'll be interesting. That said, what we did get, I thought was very good. Oh, totally. No, I mean, yeah. The rewatch. I mean, watching this anime helped me remember, like, oh wow, yeah, this story, like, early on, really, really went for it. Yeah, the, yeah, the the, the way they were able to build up build up tension and the I, I liked the pace that it moved at. Um, it felt like things were constantly happening. Um, is Norman dead? 
that was I will put down money he is not I, I didn't think so but I I was I I guess we don't really I guess we don't really know gee I, I I'll just let you stay silent on that one but uh the <laughs> you know I I did not I did not expect him to not be with them when they escaped so let's put it that way um you know uh, but like, that's what makes for a good escape. Yeah, that, right? that is that a, makes good, for a good also like plot. escalation like, a hu- at yeah, the moment. At like, least. Yeah, because the the worst thing an escape story can do is make you feel that there is no there are no consequences for their mistakes. Right, that the people trying to escape can fuck up as often as they want, and that they will never suffer actually suffer for their attempt. Whereas, like, I think the really good thing the Promise Neverland does is like actually it's like again, not nah, dog. You're trying to escape and we're going to punish you if we catch you or if you fuck up. For right. It. And that's exactly what happens. Yeah. And I, th- yeah. Like, cause like if it's like, okay, here's our plan and then everything goes according to their plan, then th- that's like not interesting to watch. Right. Like you got to see what, right, right. You know, what happens when things go wrong. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I thought all of that was good. Um, I don't know if there's some kind of, theme here going on with uh i thought i found the whole mother thing interesting how they're like forced to give birth or whatever i don't know if that's sort of like some kind of message about the societal pressures that are or constraints on women or whatever but uh i guess ray where he was supposed to be her, her biological son that seemed to be the case yes yeah, yeah i i could just say this outright yes the implication is when ray talks about how because if you remember earlier ray says that he has like what is it aedic memory like or fetal, whatever fetal memory or something right like he can he can remember everything right since and he, he knows the, the womb, song and he knows the song right. yes so like yes the implication is that the only way you could well he, he says why did you give birth to me or something? So I, I, yeah, that yeah, was yeah, pretty yeah. Uh, conclusive. Yeah, it's pretty on the nose by the end there. Yes. But, uh, um, yeah. And uh, I mean, there's something to be said about like, you know, when, you know, I mean, obviously in the flashback it implies that Mama herself also once tried to escape and like the kind of like right. idea I, of I, like. I kind of it earlier when like when Crone tries to report in. Yes. And yes. Grandma is like, well, as long as you keep them under control. It doesn't really matter. Or, right, yes. There's this get, idea that, like... like two-second flashback, and yes. you go, oh, okay. Yeah, there's, there's kind of this theme of the... I mean, again, it's a great theme that... Not that big of a spoiler, but I don't... At least up till the point in the manga, they don't really explore anymore, is, like, kind of the cyclical, self-reinforced nature of, of, of slavery, often by the enslaved themselves, right? By collaborators. By, by people who... And you're you know, stuck in we'll, a status quo. Anything outside that status quo looks impossible. Right, right. And like, if you're offered something that is even slightly above that status quo, <laughs> like you'll jump on it because you can't imagine anything better. And, and like, you need that upward mobility, man. Right, and that is kind of the that is kind of what is reinforced. Like the most tr- like the most horrifying thing that dem- the the demon like the demons have done to to humanity is convince them convince humanity that they themselves need to carry out this cycle. Right. Like if you if you've watched up till now, like I think I mean I think it's an interesting thematic thing that I'm sure you guys have noticed as well is that at least in season one, demons haven't really done anything. Yeah. All the vil- all the villainy carried out in the Promised Neverland is by humans against other humans. Right. Like mm-hmm. that's a fuck. A demons don't need demons don't need to stoop to that low on the totem pole. <laughs> at least not they just yet. sit at the table with their knife and fork and uh, wait. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, so I mean, great first season. I guess we'll see what happens. So they said it's gonna be twenty twenty, so it's not gonna be anytime soon for season two. Sure, but, uh, yeah, that's fine. I mean, again, I think we've talked about this with My Hero Academia that like we're kind of living in that era now where shonen anime no longer need to like be airing twenty four seven unless your name is One Piece. That's still going, huh? Grandfathered in, like Grand One Piece is grandfathered in, right? You yes. know, like <laughs> yeah, like, grandfathered in along with like what Gintama and uh, well, even Gintama takes breaks though. Like that's what a fucking Detective Conan or something. <laughs> <laughs> I guess going full circle, Gintama is the one that had the the one famous episode title about Prison Break, where it was like. I forget, I forget right. this whole thing. It's not really a prison break because life is a prison. Yeah, yes. it, it was like some ridiculously long episode title about uh, you know, the you still call the show Prison Break after they get out of prison when you realize that society is a prison or something like that. But yeah, um, 
I was wondering if that was actually a jab at uh, Prison School, which uh, I don't know if y'all remember that manga slash anime from a few years back. Which was another one that I'm not going to stand here and defend Prison School as like some fucking great piece of writing. But uh, the escape part of Prison School is maybe one of the most audacious escapes I have ever seen in in fiction. <laughs> like sure. the sheer... The sheer places that story was willing to go to achieve that escape. That was... Uh, and then everything afterwards was nowhere near as good. Certainly a show. Um, <laughs> all right. Speaking of shows, there's certainly shows. Yes. Okay, Next now time. we can get into it. Just repeat everything you said 20 minutes ago. All right, once again, set aside another 30 minutes <laughs> because we are, we are just going to go right into it. Probably not really. I actually don't have... Well, let's see. Maybe if you guys get me wound up enough, we'll be able to go that long. But I don't know if I have necessarily that many things to so, say. So, gee, about. did we find out what the price of smiles was? Yeah, turns out it's fucking nothing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I thought it was. I thought the price of smiles was all modern technology. It's bomber cells. Oh, it was the... blowing up all technology, yeah, well, taking us back to the Stone Age. You know, except electricity, it's not the Stone Age because... electricity is evil and causes us to fight each other. Except that we blew up all technology, but apparently we still have electricity and modern medicine and and combustion engines. Uh. Like, cars still work? Apparently the only thing we destroyed by destroying all technology were were the robots? So we're going back to this. We climbed to this this tower and pushed the end war button on top of the tower and it ended all war and everything's fine. Jesus fucking Christ. So... Okay, so... (laughs) To start from the top, I feel like your therapist. Why don't you just, you know, tell me what? Uh, what? 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 what where did we leave off, Gel? Do you remember? Uh, okay, let me see if I can remember. There, they discovered the nano machines were killing everything. Right? Yes, somewhere yes. around okay. there, and that the technology was and, bad. Yes, and then they discovered a way to turn off all the technology, or all the crystals to give life back to the materia. Oops, I mean nano machines. Right. Uh, so it's kind of it <laughs> yeah right I'm not even joking when I say it's basically the fucking materia right no, like, yeah but I'm like is that plot wise fucking nothing is that what the war was about <laughs> like how does that end the war or so okay so uh, to kind of try to sum this up in the way that you know your Kakarui corner does the last few episodes are basically like so the first of the of the what what episodes was it like ten through twelve or some shit like that nine through twelve okay so basically uh the fucking like cool older commander of the empire squad gives his life to save his squaddies as you would expect because remember this is the price of smiles blah 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 he in his dying breath he, he tells the them all to, yeah to live on and survive blah blah blah. Uh, eventually, the princesses, uh, the the kingdom invents um, uh, Metal Gear. Uh, they <laughs> right, invent they, artillery cannon. They make a big gun that can hit anywhere in the world without retaliation. Except not really, because we see it in action, and it's kind of just a big artillery piece. Its range doesn't even seem that far. In fact, its range seems to be within visible distance. <laughs> <laughs> it's not uh, great. They make a big um, deal with the super gun, and it doesn't really do shit. Right, but it turns out that super gun is kind of a red herring, because... Right, actually, idea... what we need to do is go and find the secret tower built by the the Old Kingdom. Right, which... because the Old Kingdom built a tower that could de- delete all the bad technology before they went extinct. Yeah. And, and it's still functional. The empire It's an empire territory, and they kept it intact. And so, uh, Yang Wenli, Princess Yang Wenli, has decided to split her fleet <laughs> between a decoy fleet that will fight the Empire on the front lines, uh, using the artillery cannon to try and stall them. Meanwhile, she and a small detachment of soldiers will attempt to infiltrate Empire territory to, to activate... Push the, to the, push the end all war button. Right, to push the delete war button. <laughs> but, um... As she's going through territory, she gets intercepted by uh, our main squad from the Empire, who have been tasked with kind of guarding one of the, like, hidden side routes. You know, they're not a part of the main fight. And they catch up, and they find out, oh, shit, isn't that the fucking princess? So, it's set up as, oh, this race against time, as the Empire squad rushes after 
the princess, and the princess's like royal guard have to like stay behind to hold out while she gets the stop war button uh, set up. And the fight's not very good. The 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 budget has entirely fallen apart for this show. Uh... Uh, there are some individual shots in this in the last episode that are laughable not just like oh, laughable man. and like ah oh, man that sucks but as an Eero and I actually burst out <laughs> into full-on <laughs> belly laughter at the sheer fucking of just absurdity of some of these shots the sheer badness of some of these shots well, okay so like up. what Stella main soldier of the empire or whatever and also like busts into the tower and her Mother is helping with a princess. Right, <laughs> like Stella's mother it was a was a was a scientist from the Empire, but during the terrorist attack uh, that killed the princess's mom and dad, she got separated from her child. Who thought and she thought that her child died, so she joined the kingdom. But it turned out her child survived, and it's Stella. And the mother realizes this at the last second because her because Stella has the same I'm mole like, on her she, eye that she does. <laughs> because that's how genetics yeah. work. So then she dramatically pushes Stella out of the way of rubble that appears mysteriously. Right, because I think some like, dude like shot... The, the fight wasn't even at the tower, it was at the lake around the tower. Right. But I guess an explosion or something... Ha- rubble falls for no fucking reason. Uh, and like, the rubble falling also implies that the robots that are outside fighting could do enough damage to collapse the tower itself. So right. why do we need to send in a single person with a pistol to stop the princess from pressing the stop? Anyway, war rubble crushes science mom. Right. She pushes her. She pushes Stella out of the way, and Stella's like, "Why did you do this, blue-haired woman who I've never met and don't recognize?" And well, who she looks just like, like me. <laughs> But looks just like me, and and science mom is like, you you got to help the princess, please end the war. And she's like, okay, I guess. <laughs> Fucking goes up to the top you of the tower, me. where the princess is about to press the 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 delete war forever button, and and the prince <laughs> and, and the Stella shows up. She's got she's got the princess at gunpoint. And at first, she starts mentioning some what I believe are, frankly, I'm not even this misanthropic, but what I think are entirely reasonable suspicions. Like, you realize that deleting all the robots is not going to delete war. We'll just kill each other with sticks and rocks next, right? And the prince is just like, you're right, but I have to believe in in the human heart. And the, and the prince is, and, and Stella is just like, Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Uh, you promised that this will end war, right? And the prince is like, "I sure hope so." Okay. Let's let's push the, the end war button together. We finally met in the last episode after a bunch of rushed, dumb shit. Yes, just let's like just... a certain, just like a certain famous 1988 science fiction OVA, the two title characters after a whole season have finally met in their climactic, in the climax of the show. To push the end of the war button and all the robots stop and which mean and we instantly cut to like them signing the ceasefire as if the as if their grievances against each other Had would have solved. would have ended by pushing as the if, stop war button as if if you deleted all of the robots and like, with the emperor signing it too and like the emperor had shown up earlier in a few seconds as like, like 30 goddamn seconds as like this inc- like warmongering cold-hearted man right, right? He literally says like oh i need this war to prove like my right to kingship okay i'm signing this peace armistice now they pushed the and this push the stop war button man <laughs> they had There's to no stop war running. and and it's like it's implying that like oh just like fucking if this were a Gundam show, just because you blew up all the Gundams doesn't mean people are not just going to kill each other with jets and rifles and sticks and rocks next, okay? Mm-hmm. Like, because it they are shown to still have vehicles. It's just like, like the the thing is the Price of Smiles, the show that this was at the start, like it totally what, loses it by the end. Right, it loses like every every bit of edge and sense of ambition this show at least hinted at having at the start. Right. It's yeah. like with thought it would actually go somewhere and even if it's not going somewhere that well at least it would try to go somewhere and but it, then it just goes for the most fucking milk toast yeah like baby the thing- face shitty ass ending like they took the easiest possible route they could have taken and that's a fucking shame because the price of smiles is this incoherent mess 
But truly, its greatest sin is that it's a mess that isn't either a big enough car crash to watch from afar as a spectacle, nor does it even try to say anything. Like, again, say what you will. The show had ambition at the start. Like, its willingness to just kill off main characters, its willingness to confront, like, the very real human cost of war in a a way that a lot of anime actually don't really deal in. Its portrayal of large-scale squad tactics, its usage of tactical (laughs) big-ass ramps. Uh, And then, like, like, two-thirds in, it just loses that spark. It loses that edge. And I'm not saying, okay... I don't want to get too ahead of myself. I don't want to say the price of smiles could have ever been great or even good, even good. But it was ambitious, and I wanted to see where that ambition would take it. Because whether that turned it into something actually worth talking about, or just into the kind of spectacle we could talk about for right. years, like I was hoping it would be one of those things. Instead, it's like, just straight up like one step forward, two steps back. We'll forget about this show in six months. Totally. If even like I, I fucking I almost forgot about this show until this podcast. <laughs> like, like, look, for better or worse, for a, yeah, for better or worse, there is a reason there is a very good reason why Code Geass still exists on the tongues of modern anime discourse, because in the end, people remember that, that show. Wasn't very good, but it never stopped trying to reach for the stars, no matter how much that would comically backfire on it. And, like, people will talk about that, because that's ambitious. That's right. trying something. Whereas Price of Smiles has proved itself as beneath notice. Yeah, like, here's the thing. Everybody always talked about, like, here's the, since episode two, there's always, there was always a subsect of the fandom for Price of Smiles that was like, oh man, when is the princess just going to have enough of this shit and like just turn on the full genocide faucet on? Just like, go full, the empire must burn. Right next, like, to the, the, just, next to the stop war button is the genocide right. faucet. Right, right. Is the, you know, it turns out, you know, everybody's waiting for the princess after, to after, stay. You know, you have, after you push the end war button, you have to wash your hands. <laughs> <laughs> wash your hands like, and the genocide faucet. Saying, Look, everybody was just saying, everybody was just hoping that eventually the princess would just say, actually, the price of smiles is fire and blood. But like, and here's the thing, I'm not even saying that's an agreeable position, but boy, imagine how fucking funny this show would be if the princess (laughs) went in that direction by the end of this show. Or imagine if the princess by the end of this show actually built Metal Gear. And just like, this is how the Empire dies. There's just nothing at the the end of that show. Like, yeah. Like, the war ends and then everybody lives happily ever after. Like, there's, like, one throwaway line about, like, oh, well, you know, the world is still a chaotic place because we got rid of all technology. But, which, again, I feel like, I mean, I don't want to even get into that here, like, thematically, how misanthropic of a viewpoint yeah, it is. Like, bad. how fucking naive, how fucking childish you have to believe that, oh, getting rid of technology would make the world we good. We just again. took everyone's uh, guns away. It'd uh, be nice. Not even guns, but like, I mean, I know. You can tell that the show had to fucking cover its ass by saying, oh, only the robot technology got shut down. Because that's a very selective version of, uh, of Luddism. Like, this idea that, oh, humans were better. Humans were more honest when we didn't have technology. Maybe the old well, ways were best, G. Right. Oh, oh, society was better when we didn't have electricity and modern medicine and vaccines. Or you could, or you could like, put that, like, <laughs> I mean, you could put that, like, people saying we were better before we had the internet or before we had social media or something like that, right? Like, it's very backwards. Well, <laughs> maybe you could argue at some of the social media. I mean, I don't know, sometimes I look at social media. <laughs> but the generally, like, regressive, like, you know, dare I say conservative. Things were better 30 years ago. Yeah. It just, it, it just pretty much Definitely. ties into, yeah, it, it just very much ties into this really misanthropic mindset that, oh, like, because I specifically don't need Perhaps I'm a person, maybe I'm a, maybe I am a healthy, mentally normative person. Maybe I don't need medication to live every day or something. So of course, naturally, I just assume, oh, well, if I don't need this, then maybe nobody needs this. Right. Like, it, it, it completely ignores the idea that, oh, I don't know, uh, maybe technology can be good sometimes. And I don't know. Again, I, here's the thing. I don't even think the show is thinking that yeah, far. I, was gonna I say- really don't. Like, that's a thing. I, was say, I don't even want to chastise it. Was just war. It was just, just wanted to hit that war is bad target. Like, and I guess I don't, I sometimes wonder, like, I don't know where the fucking mindset comes from. Just like, oh, if I just 
end the war. That will just eliminate all of the pre-existing prejudice and hatred and grudges that likely existed to, you know, like a certain 1988 science fiction OVA explains that <laughs> wars don't happen. You have to stop. <laughs> wars don't happen in a vacuum. Wars don't happen because two people just don't like each other anymore. Wars happen because there are decades or centuries of pre-existing anathema between two uh, societies that are that go that, that exist in the very cultural DNA of those societies that cannot be eliminated just because oh we gave them food and presents and lettuce <laughs> push the stop war button do they give them lettuce at the end i don't even know if they do i guess maybe I it's applied i guess i guess stella when stella's like in the in the village that old lady gives her some lettuce right uh. sure all right. Well, <laughs> Lily is running the orphanage now, even though she kills a man, killed even a man. Lily killed a man but with her bare hands. Pretending Lily is like this happy, blameless anime girl, even What's though she John murdered Whitman, people. <laughs> I'm just disappointed. There That's was the no, price of smiles. I'm just disappointed there was no really like, train wreck spectacle in the end to talk about. That's right. Like I was so. Dude, I was so looking forward to telling you. The ending you, this show oh, needed was like the, the, you, Princess Yuki, who is 12 and doesn't understand the human cost of her actions, ordering the most heinous shit. Right, because, that, like, like, because that's what she thinks the price of smiles is. But she's. Right. But as we established in the first couple of episodes, she's not remotely qualified to make that decision. I think like, yeah, you really just, like, maybe, drop that title in there somewhere, too. Like somebody said, it was the title of the last. It was the title oh, of the last the episode. episode. I don't like say it, but yeah. nobody. Said somebody it. in the show had to say, no. and that's the price of smiles. And then fade to black. It's just say the end. <laughs> I just, man, this could have been like one of the greatest train wrecks of the decade, and, and then instead, it ain't shit. It, yeah, instead, it derailed. It, de- it derailed its own derailment so, in the most boring way I, possible. I guess one more thing, and I don't want to spend too much more time on it, but the <laughs> I was th- I was thinking about once again reminding everyone how did this end up being the 55th anniversary project of Tatsunoko Productions, <sighs> not a I don't even think not know, a because uh, I mean obviously everyone as we've said before it sounds like more like a Sunrise original than a uh, yeah than a uh, anything related to, right. like I did I don't see any of the Tatsunoko DNA in there whatsoever, but. Uh, no, it's yeah. it's really bizarre. I don't like if we were actually get more serious about discussing the price of smiles. It's a baffling show, not just in and of itself, but it's baffling around its production. Like the quality of the show falls apart so badly in the last half. Like animation quality just fucking dips like really dramatically. Like this thing was clearly not super well funded or not given enough time to like really develop itself, and so. What does Tatsunoko get out of this? Like, was this Tatsunoko hoping to kickstart a new franchise? Like, Ooh, yeah. many, 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 many companies have tried to kickstart their own Gundam. Many have, ninety <laughs> percent of them fail. Like, they- this is not even me being a Gundam fanboy. This is me just stating the facts that like, very few shows have ever managed to capture what Gundam did and then turn that into a long-running franchise. Do they get tired so of doing I, uh, dark, serious reboots of their existing properties? I, mean, I would have been up for one of those. I mean, the, those always turn out pretty good. Like it's, it's, yeah, and it's, 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 it's just baffling because you compare it to every other like fam- big anime company that has done an anniversary project. Like, Say what you will about how they're executed. I mean, sure, you have your Megalo boxes on one end of the, end of the spectrum, but then you have your Digimon tries on the other end of the spectrum. But like, the idea is that oof, these anniversary oof. projects... <laughs> Look, I'm just taking your word for it. I only watched like the first three episodes of Digimon Tri. Yeah, so at least, at least it makes good. sense, though. Like, with, what yeah, they, with like, like, that being an anniversary project for... Right, they are. They are. Those those projects are intrinsic to those studios or those rights holders' uh, identity. Like in terms of like uh, uh, the the properties they uh, they hold. Like fucking, what does the price of smiles even say about Tatsunoko? Right. Like it really doesn't say anything about it. Like the closest you could argue is that maybe it's the mecha stuff. But even then, Tatsunoko is not that heavy on mecha. They're more like you know power armor and suits and stuff you yeah. know like at most you have the Duranjo gang but like the mechs look nothing like that time so, book like, on mechs are 
a different, entirely different type. Of right. Effect. It's an entirely different type. Like, it's, it's as you said, this is way more like a Sunrise thing. Like, if you told me this was Sunrise celebrating their, like, 50th anniversary, that I would believe. Because, right. like, Sunrise would very much... just kind of crash from them. Right. They, they would very much try to kickstart a new, big, like, pseudo-real robot-esque franchise out of nowhere. Like, they would love that. But right. yeah. Tatsunoko? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I just well. wanted, you know, yeah. If you want to watch a twelve episode like hilarious train wreck mech show, watch Comet Lucifer from a few years back. <laughs> Barely even remember that. At least that would look good sometimes. Uh, you know that show is a hilarious train wreck, right. and entertaining. Unlike Friends with Smiles. All right. Well, now we can just forget <laughs> the show. We 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 have we have paid the price of smiles. <laughs> well, uh, yes. Now we understand the true price of smiles. <laughs> yes now you can look forward to our recap podcast um <sighs> the price of glorio gaiden um coming soon yeah, when, when they put out another uh 100 episodes of uh yeah all right, anyway all right let, let's just let's move on we got one more show to talk about yes uh a, a, on what is hopefully a much brighter yes. note yeah but i haven't been watching so, this so let me know uh, ending mere hours ago kaguya-sama love is war um you know these shows are tricky to end because, especially if they're with a, based on ongoing source material, because obviously you can't have the main couple hook up. So I don't think that's a spoiler to say that that doesn't happen at the end of this. But uh, naturally, they, they did a they did a good job though. I liked I liked the final arc and the final episode was really strong. Uh, the final arc was basically let's do summer vacation, and that's a lot of you know, will they won't they tr- trying to hang out over the break and they never do but they end up (laughs) they end up uh basically everything ends up hinging on them going to see the fireworks at the you know the festival at the end of the summer or whatever you know classic anime stuff Uh nozaki ended the same way didn't it yes it did yep same same setting (laughs) um much different results though um so I like uh, what they huh. did because as these series often do, it takes a somewhat more serious dramatic turn for like the, the final episode or two where uh, the basically they, they set up this, this date for the four of them to go, the student council members to go to the, see the fireworks and everyone's on board. And then uh, basically Kaguya's strict, terrible family intervenes and she can't go. Um, and so she's like heartbroken, but then her maid helps her sneak out and there's this big dramatic, you know, her, you know, chase to, or whatever you want to call it to, to find her. Friends, uh-huh. like, I know with, yeah. See the fireworks and so like, an yeah, movie. pretty much. And, you know, there's, there's all these twists and turns. Everyone's kind of acting more serious and out of character and what, you know, this is all stuff you you would expect, but I think the great part of it all is this is only like two thirds of the episode, and the real final punch of it all is <laughs> after after they've gone through these big dramatic, you know, uh, uh, moments and you know these big spectacles where they finally get to see the fireworks in the end after you know the president had to chase her down and he's acting all cool, which is very out of character for him. Um, the you know, they they cut to the final third of the episode, which is like the aftermath, <laughs> and everyone regrets how how like silly and over dramatic they acted, and they're super embarrassed. Uh, <laughs> like the president is like like reliving like like because uh, he he finds like Kaguya like crying in the alley. She's like, I wanted to see the fireworks, and he's like, Well, then let me show you. And then, and he's like all dramatic <laughs> and everything, and he's like reliving the moment in his head. And it's like, oh, God, I sounded like such an idiot. <laughs> Oh man! And so they're like, so the uh, final scene is like them kind of like being super shy and awkward, and it's really adorable as they kind of try to overcome that and be friends and talk to each other again, and that's where they end. So I thought that was a nice spin on like, because like the other stuff, I, I feel like every other romantic comedy would take that same like final approach with the you know make it a little more dramatic, kind of up the stakes and everything, but they would normally kind of end it there or whatever. Uh, and uh, you know, in this case, they kind of 
went that nice little extra step, <laughs> which I felt was very in line with the personality of the show. And uh, it was a good good spot to end it if you're not going to end it with them getting together. So um, just overall. So uh, season two. Yeah, season. Yeah. You know, I would be satisfied with this ending here because um, they, they did ratchet up the tension so high that I don't know if I could take another 12 episodes without anything actually happening. Um there were yeah there were a couple uh there were a couple moments where they turned the heat up in the uh, the summer vacation stretch where they even like got a little fan servicey which was weird for this show but uh so i don't know if they could i don't know if i could like sit through another 12 episodes of nothing happening so unless they were like planning on like finally pulling the trigger on the relationship i, I that said i mean i enjoyed it enough and I, there's still probably enough humor in there left where I would be fine with a season two, but I'm kind of satisfied at this point. Um, and just overall, you know, really solid comedy. I think if I someday compile my top 10 comedies of the Glorio era, it will definitely be in there. Um, really? Okay. In the Glorio era. Strong, so, strong yeah, word. In, in, the, in the top 10. I don't know where in the top 10. But. I, mean, I say that, but realistically, I don't even know if I could put together 10 comedy anime I've watched yeah. since the start of well, yeah. I mean, like the Nichi Joe count. I watched that post Glorio, technically. Uh, no, you know, so. past Cloyd season one. Oh, that doesn't count. That yeah. cuts down like a good twenty percent of the shows, of the comedies I've watched. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if Classic Cloyd season one would make my top ten. But um, oh, come on. <laughs> I, I guess we're strictly yeah, talking know, season one and uh season one and strictly off the track. strictly season uh, one yoichi fuji the fuck does that lift even look like that's like that's like saba gebu that's hina matsuri yeah i'd, I'd have to think uh, about it. I'd, have to, I'd have to list it out that's the only two i think i've watched so yeah osamatsu osamatsu sure yeah. sure uh, yeah i guess yeah I, i'd say osamatsu's highs made up for its lows double so. decker yeah, hell yeah, Double Decker would totally make that list. Yeah, I never, I never did watch that. Uh, uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's good stuff, and the I, I appreciated the production stayed fantastic throughout. They did a lot of like neat visual, like the last episode looked great, and they did a lot of like neat visual tricks in the end, like turning into everybody into airplanes. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, it, it, they, they, they just. Do they, just they have a, do they have a three minute transformation no, sequence? No, but it, it kind of makes sense in context of the episode. It's like I, I, I talked about uh, early on, like familiar. when I first talked about the show, it kind of reminded me of like like Shaft or something where they do like weird stuff to break up the dialogue or whatever. And yes, at some point they turned yeah. everybody into airplanes. But uh, sure, yeah, good stuff. It definitely hit you know my uh, you know uh, you know how I, I'm the comedy guy, and it definitely uh, gets my seal of approval. So. Um, okay. Sure. Good place to end. So. So. All right. At least something ended on a pretty solid yeah. note. <laughs> we had, you know, we so, had uh, I think, you know, we had, uh, you know, we had Mob, we had Promise Neverland, we had, we had Kaguya. I mean, those three alone are real solid for me. That maybe sure, maybe yeah. I, I guess I'm trying to, uh, yeah. I'm trying to think of the season as a whole, and I feel like, I mean, I feel like, I, I mean, I feel like for me personally, anyways, I feel like I was kind of right on the money when I said at the start of the season is that Mob Psycho was going to be kind of the anchor or linchpin of the season for me. Right. Kind of the the thing that's kind of holding it yeah, down for me that. because everything else I watched this season uh, ranged from, you know, <laughs> broadly amusing to, you know, outright, outright perilous to speak of. Yeah. So, well... We got a new batch of shows coming right around the corner, so we'll see. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure how I feel about those either. Yeah, I'm not really feeling so great <laughs> yeah. about those either, but wait, we'll we'll be on top of that. So I guess that leads to our housekeeping, so we can wrap things up here. You can check out all of our content at theglorioblog.com, including our upcoming season first looks in the not-too-distant future. So stay tuned for that. Um, I feel like I often neglect to mention some of the other things like that like chris has been working on with like he's been covering like ultraman and uh the some of the drama shows that he does um and you know we uh we've got our two cents posts yep we we, we have we've actually been putting posts out um 
over the past uh, yeah. <laughs> year. Or so, um, so you know, I feel yeah. terrible because I keep forgetting to add to them. So. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll... And uh, next week is the season two wrap up podcast for Legend of the Galactic Heroes. Yes, yes where uh, we're going to be talking about the end of season two. We might even have some guests on that one. You know who. Uh, are uh, also itching to deliver their hot takes on the uh, legendary 1988 science fiction OVA. Yes. So um, if we haven't mentioned it enough already, uh, stay tuned for <laughs> the Glorio Heroes, our sister podcast about the, you know, legendary 1988 OVA. Oh, said it so much time. Stop. Keep yes. saying it. I, love it. I had to say it one more time. <laughs> I had to get in on that action. Uh, Killing me. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, yep. So, uh, <laughs> comment, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google play Podbean. Uh, I'm probably missing somebody else wherever you find podcasts for the most part. Uh, also on our YouTube channel, you can please subscribe there. Uh, oh, I forgot our Twitter, follow us on Twitter at the Glorio blog and then you know, tell your friends, tell your enemies and that'll do it. See Thanks you everybody later for listening. We'll catch you next time. Later. What time I hear? Call the shit the lot of night. My titty curly.